Welcome to a short talk on CPU debugging. My name is Timothy Lattice, and this is the Neo Kino Graphics Channel. This is how I debug CPU code without a debugger. I use an interface called Talk or TLK. It's a message logging system. It's a better replacement for printf style debugging. You'll see that in later slides. Usage syntax is quite simple. It's TLK. I use the macro for the line number, followed by an integer, followed by a comment. The 32-bit integer will be displayed both signed and hex, and the comment is limited to 24 characters maximum. So it's very easy to go back and find the line number with the go to in the uh, editor if you see an error in the log file. So TLK outputs the line to the log file. It uses a fixed 64 character line output to the log. This has a bunch of extra information. The first is the R, the purple. That's the app reload number. The log keeps multiple restarts. The next is the time in seconds. This is the sc.milmic. This is a time in seconds with microsecond precision since the app has started. The next is that line number, the source line, followed by a hex representation of the number, followed by a signed decimal representation. And then if it's negative, I put the negative on the back side instead of the front side. And then I have the 24 character maximum string. So all messages, they end up just like this. Some of the interesting logging details. I use a fixed max size of 128K lines in a memory map file for logging. The first half is actually used for lines. The second half I use and I waste for one atomic counter. That's a 32-bit counter. The nice thing about this interface is there's no runtime file I.O. because it's a memory map file. So no kernel calls. It's literally just one lock-free thing, an atomic add, then the store of the message, and that's it. So not only is it lock-free, it has no retries. So the runtime cost is very, very simple. The way I do the 32-bit atomic counter is I have a 16-bit line in the most significant bits. That's the line I write to. And then in the lower 16 bits, I have the restart count. Thus, if I want to go to another line, I just add 65, 5, 3, 6, and that's it. I get to the next line. The implementation is easy. It's baby-friendly. There's no libc. There's no nothing. I'm sorry if this is really hard to see because I'm doing it with a screenshot of text, but if you're interested in more, you can always email me. How about some extras? I use another set of simplifying functions. One, talk B. This is a message that's ignored in release. Talk B, the B stands for bug, i.e. something I want to see only in my dev build. Talk die, that's going to message and then exit. Talk sig, this is going to signal a numbered signal and then spit out a message. Talk sig inf or infinity, this is going to wait infinitely long for a signal and then write out a message. The message will be the number of microseconds it blocked for the signal. This comes in handy when debugging. So I know right away if one of my waits returned right away without waiting, or actually I had to wait on it. As for Vulkan, I also use this for Vulkan error reporting. I use something VK error with a line number, a return, and this VK error number. So basically I just wrap the VK function calls with this. And I don't really have to do any extra code. I just wrap it and be done with it. Um, the return, the middle number, if it's zero, then I force termination. If it's one, it'll return without terminating for some errors. So for instance, for the swap chain errors, when I want to rebuild the swap chain. Note this is a filter. So if there is no error, the thing just returns the actual VK error, i.e. the thing that you passed in, which was the return of the function. So it's great. It's very simple. 
it doesn't really cost me much to implement. In fact, here's the implementation. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it, but you can see that if it's VK success, it returns. If it's suboptimal, error surface lost, or error out of date, it's returning so that I can rebuild the swap chain. If I lose the device, yeah, I just terminate the app. And then that's pretty much it. Very easy. Now let's go through some example output. This is a run in an example program. I'm going to go through some of the areas that are uh, noted by the arrows, different colors. So the first thing here is the red ones. You'll notice that the first, the top one, it says device needed. That's the point in the code when I actually need the device and then something is blocking. And then later you'll see device available. That's the point where the device, the VK device is actually open. And then device wait, and that's telling you how long it actually had to wait for that. Now we'll move on to the, the orange ones. It says card available. This is when I'm doing the, the uh, memory map file and I have available the, the file that I'm loading for the game data. And then you'll see, you'll notice later that it says cart needed. Well, that's the point where it has to be mapped. And so in this case, I didn't have to wait. So it didn't write device, it didn't write cart wait. And then, so there's no timing. So it doesn't write the debug message if, if there was no wait which is great. Now the green one is the window. It starts creating the window also in parallel with all these other tasks. And you can see we didn't need the window until quite, you know, ways down all the way at the end. Now the other ones, let's look at the purple ones. So the first purple stack, the one at the top on the right, says layout needed, layout available, and layout wait. Before you actually compile the program, this is a bindless one, and the programs are the, the module, well, the module and then the, uh, the PSOs for the Vulkan code, you need the layout. So the first thing I do after I open the device is I just build the layout, and then I get to the program compiling because typically loading or compiling programs is going to be the thing that bottlenecks you the most. So that's why layout, the first purple, is uh, done right away. And then you can see the second purple, or more reddish purple. That's when I start doing the program. So these, this one runs five, uses five different programs. And you can see the, the compile times that it prints out there for those. Those are probably cached in this case. Or maybe not, I don't actually remember. Um, and then you can see it says program available. So in this case, it actually got the programs loaded faster than uh, Windows could put the window up. And therefore, uh, program needed is at the end, it's already there, so there's no wait. And you can see this thing has a very, very fast startup time. It takes uh, 0.2956 seconds to load. And this would be a warm load, for instance. All right, so let's, let's conclude here with some benefits. Typically, my programs compile in a second, and they warm load in a second. So this edit, try, and see loop is a very, very fast. It works better than trying to get in and out of a debugger for me. So I don't use a debugger. It, this is very simple, and it works. You also notice in the output example, it's very easy to see multi-threaded behavior in the log, as the log line ordering is going to accurately represent the program order because of how it does an atomic and how there's no system calls related to the, uh, the messaging. So this gets to be a very easy to use setup for say, minimizing the startup time. And that's the first thing I did with it actually. And so this works as long as you got memory map files. Um, if you don't have memory map files, well, then you probably need a background thread that's uh, actually doing the writes to a console if that's what your platform has. Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Take care.